I'm Dr. Katrina Morrison. I'm a senior lecturer in experimental psychology at the University of Leeds and I'm particularly interested in aspects of cognition relating to memory and language. What I want to talk about today is a tool called the cognitive interview. Now the cognitive interview is a very popular tool in psychology. It's used very, very widely. And what I'd like to do is talk about it in particular in relation to forensic work. So that's work in the legal system and by the police. So is this an appropriate tool to be using in a legal setting and what are its pros and cons? There are six points I'd like to cover in relation to the cognitive interview as it's used in forensic settings. The first is eyewitness memory. So we rely very heavily on eyewitnesses in terms of giving us the information we need to make convictions. The second is eyewitness confidence. And I'm going to give you some data that might surprise you about levels of confidence among eyewitnesses and the relationship of that to the accuracy of their statements. The third then brings us on to the nature of autobiographical memory. So eyewitness accounts are accounts that we derive from our autobiographical memory. That's the memory we have for our own lives. So my memory of my life, what I think about myself and any events that have happened in my life. Then we'll go on and look at police interviewing and look at the techniques that police uh, use in interviewing suspects. And we'll look at some data that indicate that police have to be extremely careful about the techniques they use in order not to mislead the eyewitness and in order to get accurate eyewitness information. So this then brings us on to the cognitive interview as it's used in police settings. And we'll look at the question of whether this tool really is the best tool to be using to get accurate eyewitness information. The first thing we want to consider then is eyewitness memory. Eyewitness testimony is often essential in securing a conviction. We rely very heavily on eyewitnesses in order to arrive at a successful uh, conviction where a crime has occurred. Eyewitnesses with uh, very vivid accounts are generally regarded as being more accurate than our eyewitnesses who have flawed or uh, fragmentary accounts. In fact, though, what we understand about memory is that memory is not like that. And I'll go on later to describe the fragmentary nature of memory. As psychologists, what we appreciate about memory is that it is not a videotape account of, of our lives. The final point here is that eyewitnesses often get it wrong. They conflate things. It's not necessarily consciously not wanting to tell the truth, but memory is highly fallible. And so eyewitnesses, while we, we should rely on their evidence, we must also bear in mind that uh, their evidence may not give us a completely accurate account of an event that's occurred. So this is one of the reasons why uh, the cognitive interview is a really useful tool in semi-structured uh, interviewing techniques to get an accurate account of an event that's occurred from an eyewitness. A classic uh, study that shows us about the fallibility of eyewitness testimony came from Loftus and Palmer 1974. Now that's a very long time ago, but this is a, a, a highly regarded study that's been replicated many, many times since and gives us a real insight into the fallibility of eyewitness memory. So what participants were asked to do is they were shown videos of car, a car colliding, two cars colliding. And the question they were asked was, how fast were the cars going when they blank each other? So looking at the range of verbs that were used in this particular question, what they found was a very striking result, such that the speed estimate in miles per hour of the cars varied dramatically depending upon the word that was used in the blank. So when subjects were asked how fast where the car is going when they smashed each other, the speed estimate was an average of 40.8 miles per hour. Collided, 39.3, bumped, 38.1, hit, 34 miles per hour, and contacted, 31.8%. So what we see here is a very dramatic finding. All the subjects were looking at the same video. There was no difference in the actual speed of the cars. And yet, by using this very emotive language that suggested a high impact collision, 
the word smashed, then the estimate of participants is very much greater than it is when more neutral words are used. So what these data demonstrate is the way in which very simple alterations to the language that are, that's used in questioning an eyewitness can have a very dramatic effect on the information that they give us. Another clever thing that Loftus and Palmer did was in a follow-up question, they changed just one tiny word in their question and got a, another dramatic finding. To some of the subjects, they asked the question, did you see a broken headlight? To other of the subjects, they asked the question, did you see the broken headlight? Now, the second question, did you see the broken headlight, suggests that there must have been a broken headlight at the scene of the accident. And what they found here was that when they asked the subjects, did you see a broken headlight? 7% of subjects said yes. In fact, there was no broken headlight in the scene at all. But when they asked the, did you see the broken headlight question, then 18% of participants said, yes, they did see the broken headlight. So you see here a sense in which subjects in the latter category, the broken headlight uh, question, are almost wanting to please the experimenter and tell them what they think they want to hear. So some very compelling evidence there from Loftus and Palmer that the simple changes in the words that you use in interrogating uh, eyewitnesses can have a dramatic effect on the information that they give you. Now on to eyewitness confidence. Confident eyewitnesses are intuitively regarded as being more reliable eyewitnesses and indeed they are seen as being more reliable in the eyes of the jury, the judicial system, the judges, the police and so on. In fact, when you look at it experimentally, you ask people to give you memories of events that have occurred earlier and you ask them to rate how confident they were, you then establish how accurate that memory was there is little relationship between the confidence rating they give and the level of accuracy of, of the memory. So it's not the case that confidence equals accuracy. More confident eyewitnesses are not more accurate eyewitnesses. This is what Daniel Schachter in his book, The Seven Sins of Memory, called suggestibility. And what it is is the incorporation of external events, into your personal memory. So it's not a conscious thing, you're not deliberately trying to deceive, but you're incorporating external things into your account of what happened. And it brings me back to the fact that autobiographical memory is not a videotape of your life. It's a reconstruction. It's almost like a Chinese whispers thing that when you think about things and embellish them, you unconsciously may be coming out with a story that is not really that much like what actually happened uh, originally. Eyewitness testimony is particularly susceptible to uh, suggestibility and let me give you a, a really good example of that. So here we have an eyewitness viewing a lineup of possible uh, suspects uh, with a police officer in tow and they're saying oh my god and I don't know pause it's one of those two pause but I don't know Oh man, the guy a little bit taller than number two. It's one of those two, but I don't know. 30 minutes later, the eyewitness is still undecided. I don't know, number two? Police officer says, okay. Now, that's an innocent okay on the part of the police officer. However, it has a dramatic effect on the confidence of that eyewitness. So they've eventually made a decision about number two, but you can see that there's a large degree of uncertainty in their decision making. However, look at the effect that this has on the eyewitness by the time they've come to court several months later. So the defence lawyer says, you were positive it was number two, it wasn't a maybe, and the eyewitness says, there was no maybe about it, I was absolutely positive. Well, this example very clearly demonstrates to us is that here we have somebody who's not at all confident to begin with. Due to suggestibility, they become extremely confident and lo and behold, this memory is a very confident account of, of, of what happened. And in fact, to begin with, the eyewitness was not at all confident. So, back to my point, confidence does not equal accuracy.